I um, am happy to introduce our panel uh, for transformative education, formative justice. And uh, so Chris Higgins is at the end here. Um, he's an associate professor and chair of the Department of Formative Education. He's also the director of the Transformative Educational Studies uh, program and the co-director of the Formative Leadership Education Project, which is our uh, Kern funded project. Um, he is the author of The Good Life of Teaching and Ethics of Professional Practice. And he has a new book that's under review entitled Undeclared, A Philosophy of Formative Higher Education. So he'll be leading us today. And then with Chris, we've got uh, four students here from BC. Uh, Emmeline Brenner is a rising sophomore at the Lynch School of Education. She is majoring in transformative educational studies and minoring in restorative justice. On campus, she is an undergraduate research assistant, heads a volunteer club, and works with youth at the Salvation Army, and is a member of the Lynch School Senate. Adam Marino is from Long Island, New York. He is a rising senior in the Lynch School and a double major in biology and transformative education studies. On campus, he is the head of the Lynch School Senate's mentorship program, a freshman league group mentor, as well as a former group leader and tutor for the May River Scholars Project. Zoe Parker is a rising senior at Boston College, pursuing a bachelor's degree with majors in elementary education and sociology. Post-graduation, Zoe plans to teach full-time in the greater Atlanta area, where she is from originally. And Linnea Prius is, uh, graduated from Boston College in May, so she is she's done on her way out the door, uh, with a degree in psychology and international studies. During her time at BC, Linnea enjoyed being a resident assistant and an officer in the Global Conversations, a club that organizes and facilitates conversations between students at BC and universities around the world. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Chris, who will give us a bit of an orientation. Thanks, Sam. I'm excited to do this. And thank you to the Kern Family Foundation. This is a wonderful project. We're really excited about it. And um, the team asked me to tell you a little bit about this undergraduate program that's now uh, two, two, three years old. How old are we? Two? I think two years old. Um, Transformative Educational Studies, the program I direct, that's now sort of the center of this brand new department of formative education that we feel like is the first of its kind, or one of very few with such a focus uh, in the whole world. We're so excited. Uh, the department is, as I've told a couple people already, now 28 days old. Um, no growing pains yet, um, just a lot of excitement. Um, so I'm really happy that you're here, back, back and forth between Yawkey. It puts me in mind of the Postal Service, who said, neither snow, rain, heat, nor gloom of overnight oats with chia seeds, and I don't know what else will deter us from our daily, and you get the idea. Um, so no, uh, frustrated stand-up comedian, but mainly I want to tell you about the Transformative Educational Studies Program, which I'll probably call TES throughout with our shorthand. And you might ask me, all right, so by transformative educational studies, um, do you mean that the studies are transformational for the student, or do you mean that you study transformations? And I say, exactly, it's both. Uh, you know, we wanted that, um, that, that double meaning on the one hand, you know, we, we want to study the past, present, and future of human beings' attempts to form ourselves um, uh, to a fuller humanity, to, to reach for lives of meaning and purpose oriented around what matters. So we study human transformations, and we want to study them from an interdisciplinary and especially in a humane way. And I say humane, old-fashioned word you hear, well, there's a humane society if you're a pet person like me, but also you hear it in like the graduation ceremony. Someone gets the doctor of humane letters and you're like, oh, what is that? Um, I use it because the kind of learning I'm talking about um, doesn't always happen in the humanities, but of course they're central to the traditions of humane learning and they sometimes happen in the social sciences and natural sciences or out beyond the academy in the world of work or or, or friendship, there's all different uh, sites and forms of humane learning. Um, but we do, we draw on disciplines of philosophy and history and anthropology and sociology and political theory um, to raise this kind of fundamental questions uh, about what it means to be an educated person and, and to lead a good life. So we study uh, human transformations, um, the struggle to realize the good more fully, um, to develop ourselves um, individually and collectively. But of course, also, we hope that word would signal that as a major, we, we want our classes to be transformative. Now, it's easy to add that word. It's kind of like a, 
you know, um, you know, your teeth will be three shades whiter in two weeks or just a big thumbs up, right? Transformative. Um, but so I'm going to say a little bit more later when I start talking um, with the students here uh, about what I mean by transformative learning. But I want to say one thing about it now, which is that, you know, we know that it's not a transformative experience when there is a strong separation or a divorce between your sense of what you're studying and the so-called real world or your life or yourself. If you're not making those connections between uh, the subject being discussed, the text you're reading, the debate you're having, and the kinds of questions you actually ask yourself, the kinds of things you actually worry about, your, own, your ambitions, uh, your concerns, your dilemmas, then something's gone wrong. And, and to put it now in a positive form, when you do make those connections, learning resonates in a way and, and, and has this kind of transformational impact. So our classes are designed to connect with the questions that any undergraduate, by definition, is asking. So a couple of our classes meet the BC core requirements, but my, in my dream of dreams, like if I could take over, I think of our classes as like the core of the core because they raise the question that is sort of preliminary to and central to liberal learning, which is what does it mean to be an educated person? Uh, according to what aims and ideals am I going to attempt to give shape to my education and my life? Because isn't that, I mean, we call it higher education for a reason, right? We don't just mean um, higher training or more schooling. We give it this different name because among other things, I think it's a time we're trying to signal when a student starts to take more active leadership in shaping their own education. And if you're gonna do that, you need spaces and provocations to think about what that means and what direction you want to lead your learning. And our classes are, are designed to do that, to, um, to, to give students um, textual interlocutors, people who've wrestled deeply with the question of what it means to be a human and to grow um, and to talk to each other and their professors uh, about the ideals uh, that have uh, and will shape their education. So it's, uh, we study transformation, it's meant to be transformative, and so you might say, okay, so who takes your classes? And for that, um, here's the way I like to answer that question. I say, they're actually you know, very specialized and they're not really open to very many students. They're only open to students, you ever heard this little spiel before? Yeah, all right. Um, Twice, okay. I'm gonna speed it up now that I've heard that this is the third time for Adam, but um, so our courses really only are good for people who fall into one of the following five categories. The first category is future teachers. Now we're not a licensure uh, program, but we do have some majors who plan to be teachers and, and seek licensure in a fifth year uh, program or a master's, and of course we draw lots of non-majors and we think it's a great program for future teachers. John Dewey has this great line about how a teacher can't be a private in somebody else's army, right? Or we could just sort of talk about the fact that teaching is one of the most chronically deprofessionalized professions. There was a sociologist, mid 20th century, had this charming phrase saying that teaching, nursing, social work, and all the historically feminized professions were semi-professions. And at first I thought, how rude. And then I thought, actually, that's quite honest because professionalization is a social game where you make a bid for autonomy and respect. And in the historically feminized professions in our um, sexist society, if I may, um, the bid for professionalization uh, for teaching has never been completed. Um, and part of that is this, this complete heteronomy. Everybody has a say about what you do as a teacher. Um, you know, the students, parents, the press, politicians, your administrators, um, everyone but you, it seems like, right? So um, not a private in somebody else's army. And so these courses help teachers connect with basic questions of aims um, in education, which I think arms them to, I don't know, like that metaphor, because that's, I don't like that metaphor, backing up. It provides them with the means to join those conversations as an equal or as a leader, questions about what are the aims of schooling? I think about the, the surgeon who might say, I will not operate under these conditions. And I wonder, where is that teacherly gesture who says, I will not teach, this, this is not teaching. This is test prep. Or this is only classroom management. Or um, we, we need to, so I think our classes uh, are good for future teachers. 
But if you don't fall, fall in that category, maybe you don't want to be a teacher, you might fall in one of the following other ones. Maybe one day you might want to be a parent. It seems also that reflecting on um, questions, deep questions of human development, how we grow and what we ought to grow into might be good for future parents. If you don't meet any of those two categories, um, you might find yourself in a category called citizen. It seems to me that educational studies, this kind of broad interdisciplinary examination of, of aims and purposes of education, um, you know, what does democratic education look like? What does it mean to be an educated person? And so on and so forth. Those are the kinds of questions you need to be conversant about uh, because you will be one of the people in the conversation about how to educate the next generation. So future teachers, future parents, citizens of a nation state. Um, also, another small category is if you're currently a student, it seems to me that these courses might be good for you because they, you get my joke now, I'll try to speed up Adam, I'm trying, I'm trying. Um, so current students need the space to reflect on what, what was that K-12 schooling? What were they doing to me? Under whose authority? Why didn't they ever consult me? What was that all about? You know? um, and what do I want to do now with the college experience? And finally, if you fall in the category of human being, it strikes me personally as a philosopher, as a humanist, that the deepest and most interesting questions, um, so there really are at the heart of humanities, are questions about you know, what is our nature and condition? What ought we to grow into? What is human flourishing? And what is it that moves us toward that which is good for us, given our nature and condition? Those are the basic questions, um, sort of enduring questions of the arts and humanities. And they're also very deeply and very centrally educational questions. All right, so that is an intro. Um, sure, if you'll give me a couple more minutes, I would like to tell you about a couple classes. So just the first two. So. We start uh, TES majors, and it's also a big draw for, because it meets philosophy to BC core requirement for non-majors. We start with a class called the Educational Conversation. And what that class is about is about trying to invite students who, who let's, just, let's admit, probably haven't been invited into a conversation about uh, the ends and means of education in their K-12 schooling. I hope they have. But to now invite them in and say, you have a place in this conversation as a student who's shaping your own learning, as a future citizen, you have a place in this conversation and, um, and we wanna hear your voice in it. Here are some interlocutors, um, past and present, who think in interesting ways about education. Um, and as I said, it starts with this kind of debrief about the schooling experience and, and giving some text and some chances to process some of the aspects of schooling, which are Inhumane, I used the word humane before, let's use the word inhumane, right? Um, um, pitting each, each other against each other in a, in a brutal competition, a kind of Hunger Games style bid for universities that, whose claim to fame is the number of people they reject, right? That's how we measure the quality of a university too often is by its rejection rate. So that's a little bit about 1050 and 1051 is called Reimagining School and Society. If the first course is sort of um, history with a historical inflection, sorry, philosophy with a historical inflection. The second course is sort of a blend of history, sociology, anthropology, and then some more philosophy. And reimagining says, when did we invent schools? In the, in the modern sense, modern schooling, and why? What were the social needs and the, and the purposes that flowed into the invention of this incredibly powerful and in some ways wonderful, but also very peculiar and problematic educational tool that we invented? It helps students, I think, Break that equation that education equals schooling? What's the place of formal education in our broader formation? And given that schools had this particular trajectory, they're really only, in the form we know it, a couple hundred years old, um, how has the world changed partly through our schooling of ourselves um, so that we now need to reimagine what schools are like to deal with um, the, the social problems that confront us? All right, so that's a little bit about the major, and here's what we thought we'd do. I have four students, two majors, two um, who took uh, one or more TES classes, but were non-majors. And um, I'm just going to pose questions to them that are the kinds of questions that we talk about in TES. And they're going to think out loud. They're brave enough to come here and think out loud. Um, I mean, I, I shared the questions with them in advance, but we also didn't want this to be um, rehearsed. So uh, I'm going to pose them questions. They're going to respond, and then we'll leave a half an hour for you to engage all of us as well. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so 
we talk about educating the whole person at BC and elsewhere, and, and it seems like one of the things about that is that there's a very, this is, this is not a new idea. There's a lot of people for, uh, for a long time who have cared about this ideal, and so it's sort of established, and I think that one of the challenges for us then is to say, how do we make a fresh case for holistic education? And so the first question I want to pose to you all is, why is whole person education especially important in this day and age? Who wants to tackle that? Linnea, okay. Yeah, so I think my first initial response to that would be, I think that whole person education is especially important because one, it changes the way that students think about themselves, and two, it changes the way that educators think about their students. And I think by that, I mean that a whole person education speaks value to students. I know that myself, I've had questions go through my head throughout my K-12 education. What am I here for? Am I cared for? Uh, another one that was pretty frequent for me is, am I just another cog in the machine? And so I think that a whole person education really gives that identity to students that they're looking for, they're craving for in these questions. And when educators teach them as whole persons and not just brains, intellectual brains, um, but also address the other aspects of who they are as beings, I think that that really makes students feel like distinctive individuals who have value. So I feel like that would be the first reason. And then more on the educator side, bringing that into it as well. I think that a whole person education makes the classroom more egalitarian, I would say, in that you have the educators saying to their students, your perspectives matter as much as any adult's perspective. Um, your conversation, what you have to say in conversations is meaningful. And so I think that in a way, I would also say that it's especially important in our day and age because it breaks down kind of a barrier that, at least in my experience, I have seen between youth and adults. I think that it more brings both into conversation of seeing each other as, in a way, intellectual equals. And I think that's really important. And yeah, I think, I, yeah. Can I um, follow? I, I love both parts of that. I want to underline something in the first part and then ask you a question about the second part. So what I like about the first part is I find it su surprising, but right at the same time, like I can imagine someone talking about whole person education in a very generic way. Like, this is our civic nature, and, and here's what spiritual formation looks like. But your, your intuition is that it actually brings out the distinctiveness of person. Not like, a, here's a model of the whole person that applies to everybody, but people's distinctiveness comes into the room. And then I love how you put it. It's not just about talking about values, but the student feeling valued mm -hmm. for who they are. Yeah. I love that first part. The second part, I'm sort of with you, but I'm not quite with you yet. I want to hear more. Like, why, why does it lead to a more egalitarian classroom? Because couldn't there be somebody who's, um, you know, Mr. Um, I was going to say Mr. Or, or Mrs., but it's probably Mr. Mr. I'm so proud of my expertise, full professor who's giving the lecture on the theory of whole person education or something like that. That wouldn't be egalitarian. So what? tell me more about why you feel like a whole person approach tends to equalize in the classroom. Yeah. I think that a whole person approach really leans into students as coming with their own background perspectives and into the classroom. And also I think breaking down that barrier between school and your life outside of school. And so when a whole person education says, I recognize you for whatever it is, your knowledge, your understandings that you're coming into the classroom with, I think that that's when particularly the whole person part if an educator chooses to adopt that perspective in their teaching can really make it more egalitarian in that they realize the resources students have in their own lives and bring into the classroom themselves. Does that make sense? It makes sense? perfect sense because I got this image of like model one is like um, teaching you trigonometry or something. It's like an empty bucket. I fill it with trigonometry facts. But if it's whole person education, there's, I'm starting with a person already. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we're not starting from scratch. It's not just transmission. So you have to, I like that a lot. Thank you. All right. So the second question is so, sort of still in the spirit of like, where are we at right now with holistic education? So, but I want to now talk about obstacles. Are there, are there particular obstacles in this day and age um, to, to educating holistically? It, it could be obstacles in the way schools are set up or social forces and pressures. Who wants to tackle that? Okay. Anna? Check. Hello. Okay, cool. Um, I 
think about this sort of question a lot because I'm really into like reform and thinking about, you know, in what ways could my education have been better or like more beneficial? And I think, you know, a holistic approach would have been probably better than the solely academic approach that I've sort of witnessed. Um, so I think like major roadblocks as of right now, you know, one of which is, you know, in a bunch of our classes, we talk about like top-down reform and like the importance of like having, you know, a collegiate sort of university protocol that supports, you know, an education or a curriculum that, you know, has this I this particular idea of achievement, I'm gonna say. Um, and I think that in particular, that definition of achievement um, that we sort of see sort of weighs down any sort of alternate form of curriculum that we could have, like holistic ed. Um, going into that a little bit more, I think, you know, in sort of the early stages of education for me, it's always been about, you know, memorization ed, essentially, um, where, you know, my elementary school assessments were always like, uh, based on like, you know, historical facts, dates, figures, and, you know, any sort of problem solving skills they tried to help you with, you know, in math and science were already based on, you know, previously memorized formulas and equations and whatnot. Um, and, you know, being a high achiever in that sort of curriculum leads to, you know, you being able to memorize better than anyone else. Um, and I think that that definition of achievement carries through into higher ed, you know, where you even said it before, you know, like when I was applying to colleges, I was thinking about, you know, like average ACT, average SAT scores, you know, like the big tests and whatnot going into it. Um, and I was even looking at like outputs. And as, you know, Linnea put it before, cogs in the big machine, like colleges are so focused on, you know, a curriculum that promotes such money hungry, you know, like positive, in a way, sort of not well-rounded individuals, I want to say. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with having, you know, like a job at a college or a well-paying job at a college, but the focus there sort of leaves out that sort of whole person ed that we would like so see after essentially in our major. Like this is what we talk about often. Um, and I also think, you know, building off of that a little bit more, there's another major roadblock that sort of ties into it, which I think is, you know, the development of technology um, and leaving out opinions of whether or not technology has been like really good or bad for education. Uh, I think that it sort of serves as a pseudo holistic ed of its own, um, just in the ways that I'm thinking of, the, you know, the rabbit hole podcast from earlier this week. So, um, I've been in, you know, Professor Higgins' classes for quite some time. New York Times podcast about this kid who gets sucked into an alt-right rabbit hole on YouTube and then pulled into a far-left rabbit hole yeah. uh, civic formation via YouTube. Go. Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> Appreciate it. Hope everyone got the context. Um, and, you know, it's through media like YouTube, like even social media like Snapchat and Instagram that people are, you know, consuming most of their, you know, interactions with other people and developing themselves. And this guy, Caleb Kane, that we're talking about in the podcast, he really found himself, um, he formed his own value systems, you know, uh, based his opinions off of critical discourse and conversation and stuff like that um, on this plane that was so completely different than, you know, what the curriculum was. You know, like if the curriculum is the end all be all, then, you know, you're in a strictly academic environment, strictly, you know, basing your experiences off of what the test is gonna ask. Uh, and I think that, you know, tying into the, the whole tech, con yeah sorry, the whole tech conversation with this sort of level of achievement, you know, sort of wrapping it all up together, I'll sort of get to the conclusion. I know I can ramble a little bit, but um, the two major things are, you know, having, you know, this Carnegie unit of education that's so set on, you know, achievement in the ways that, you know, you're gonna be able to survive and like essentially bolster the US news stats of your university. Um, and on the other side of the coin, there's, you know, already a sort of pseudo system set in place for holistic ed. Um, so why go through all of the difficulty and, you know, sort of rerouting of this whole widely agreed upon system to sort of, you know, just for holistic ed, which, you know, I think is very difficult in today's modern day and age. Wonderful. A lot in there, working backwards. Um, a plus for mentioning the Carnegie unit <laughs> instead of the nor more normal term credit. Um, but we read that piece by Tack yeah. and Kuvin, yeah. so yeah. Um, a plus there. Okay. Um, but working backward, love, love your technology answer, your thoughts about that. Um, the one before that is um, you're like, well, there's no particular obstacle other than the entire ethos yeah. of schooling <laughs> and college and our definitions of success, which is brutal, but um, rings of truth. 
And then I just want to close by saying I respect someone who could hold a grudge from elementary school. <laughs> so I'm glad you're still thinking about uh, how they did you wrong in, in elementary school. Yeah. Um, Emmeline or Zoe, either of you want to follow up on, on this set of questions about educating the whole person this day and age? Okay. Okay. Um, I agree with a lot of what Adam said about obstacles, especially the achievement portion of it. I think that a lot of education that I've seen in my own schooling experiences, as well as my um, practicum experiences doing some student teaching through the Lynch School, um, there's such a, a priority placed on achievement and hitting a benchmark and hitting the things that are on the rubric and earning those good grades. And there's not a lot of emphasis on the other aspects of what truly understanding and engaging with the curriculum or the material being taught is. It's a lot of, okay, let's make sure the kids can complete this academic aspect of it, but not really focusing on whether or not they're truly grasping the concept. And I think that this is compounded a little bit by technology um, being in schooling. Um, there are obviously positives to technology, I think, uh, one of the biggest positives is accessibility. Um, we see this with the pandemic where sh schools were shut down and we could hop onto Zoom and do that kind of thing. But in turn, you can't necessarily ha grasp the same educational experience through a Zoom screen. You get tired, you have s computer fatigue, that kind of thing. And it's a lot different than being able to be in a classroom and learn that kind of thing. One of my pre-practicums, the first one I did, was completely virtual, and it was with first graders. And we were teaching them to learn how to read and write. And I would drag my computer cursor along with the words, and I would verify their letters by them holding it up mirror image to see if they were hitting the right marks. So it kind of it allowed the educational pursuit to continue, but it by no by no means was the same. And I think also reflecting back on my K through 12 experiences, I had a lot of technology integration, like that's kind of our day and age. Um, we still have our laptops and everything in classes to this day, I would say. Um, and so thinking about that aspect of it, I think what Adam discussed about memorization is huge and still present in schooling and has been that way for decades at this point. It's, I can look back and, remember the quadratic formula, but I don't know what it does. Um, so I think that's one aspect of it. And it's not really educating the whole person in a sense, you're just focusing on that curriculum. And I think that touches back to what Linnea discussed earlier, uh, the value of a student as an individual is really important. And that approaching that and trying to educate a whole person all aspects of an individual is something that really should be focused on in schooling apart from just an academic attainment. Thank you for that. And it's not like I disagree about Zoom and the whole person, but just to play devil's advocate, do you think there's one way in which Zoom brought in a little bit more of the whole student in the sense that you meet people's cats and dogs and the embarrassing poster behind them? And I found out one of my students is completely obsessed with crossword puzzles because the entire wall that in one of the classes we were in where her whole wall was finished puzzle. I mean, you think there's like a little bit of like, weirdly we get led into people's homes. Yeah, I think in a sense, I mean, I love seeing my professor's dogs on the Zoom calls. <laughs> um, in some ways, I think that technology like definitely can expand education, but not necessarily in a like, traditional sense, I think. I mean, you can look at like YouTube videos or recipes or what that kind of thing. You can expand informally on your education and be able to pursue with a passion what you really want to educate yourself on or that kind of thing. But I think it does pose a difficulty when it's like 30 faces, yep. cameras on or off to um, attack or approach one big topic. Yeah, I was but. assuming the camera was on, wasn't I? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, next question. So I, me I mentioned that we want to think about how individual transformations and social transformations are occurring. But I didn't mean that, that they're like these two separate things. I think they're, they're intertwined, or at least I want to suggest that's a possibility. So my question, the next question is, um, in what ways might they be intertwined, the individual and the collective? Emmeline, you haven't had a chance yet. You want to take that one? Okay. Absolutely. Um, so I think part of our major that really connects with me personally is the educational equity part that we talk about. 
um, Professor Scott Sider led a class for our major um, called Transformative Teaching and Learning. And one of the main tenets of transformative teaching and learning underneath the research really is that culturally relevant teaching is what engages students. Um, and I'm currently in a teacher training program, and we're talking about how to talk about concepts of race, equity, um, diversity, and inclusion in the classroom. Um, and I think this can take so many different forms. For me specifically, I'm teaching pre-algebra. And so, you know, how do you intertwine these concepts? Um, but I think there's so many different things um, that you can do. For example, we have advisories in this teaching training program where we can speak to these concepts and speak to the students' experience in a way where they themselves feel seen and heard in the classroom. Um, and I think throughout my high school experience, I had um, an opportunity to become involved in social activism. I led the social activism club on campus. Um, and I feel like this discussion style learning in my high school where four out of my five classes, excluding math, was all about discussion-based learning. Those were the classes I loved because I really felt like we could discuss current events and my thoughts on them and um, it made me feel seen as a student. Um, and recently I was doing a reading uh, by this uh, author named Bobby Harrow and he talks about the cycle of liberation and he says people want to liberate when there is there's a moment of awakening where cognitive dissonance is created and I think that in within schooling we find cognitive dissonance when we have dialogue with others um, and especially like in the class that we the four of us were in um, we were able to like hear each other's concepts of what makes a global citizen. And my con when I first came to class, I had a different conception of what that was than my classmates did. And being able to listen to their views on it, it brought into my own view. Um, and I really think that's where the true learning comes in. And in terms of how this whole person holistic education relates to social transformation, um, you know, we're all going to be entering the workplace or have entered the workplace. And you start to think about where do I fit into the to the power structures, how does my privilege influence my place in the world? Um, as someone that wants to be a teacher, that's some, something I thought a lot about. Um, and we read this, a really amazing uh, piece by about what it means to be a good citizen. And it talked about three different types of good citizens. Um, and there's like the good neighbor, and then there's a the person that donates to the food drive, and then there's a the person that organizes the food drive and thinks about systems as a whole and greater inequalities. And I think that how can you not if you're part of culturally relevant teaching or you experience it yourself, you really start to think about um, where you fit into that social order and where society as a whole is failing you and where you feel like you need to go out into the community and change something. And so I really think the two things are intertwined. So I, I hear you saying that um, if you are in, uh, teaching the whole person, part of that is you're engaging their agency, their sense of, of being an active agent in the world. So then they're more inclined to be that third kind of citizen that's making things happen and very interesting, thank you. Um, all right, so the next question is, I mentioned before, I said different ways to, to, to define transformative learning. Uh, and I said one was there's an authentic connection. Um, you don't feel like that's like learning versus life. Another would go like this, that when we, when we talk about transformation and not just formation, we're just acknowledging the fact that you're not starting from scratch and that um, formative experiences often involve serious tasks of unlearning. You have to let go of a previous habit. You have to make room for a new idea in, in your worldview. You have to rethink the, the values that have been driving. So there's, there's the processes of unlearning um, that mark a transformative educational moment. And those are, those are challenging. Um, so my next question is, what are the great tasks of unlearning um, today? Who wants to tackle that? Zoe. Um, I think with the task of unlearning and just, it really starts with societal transformation and kind of back to what Emmeline was discussing about citizenship, like thinking about what your responsibilities are as an individual and often that involves getting uncomfortable and um, moving away from what you've known or been familiar with for life your life as so far or what you've been experiencing in schooling and all that kind of thing and I think a big part of becoming uncomfortable is confronting your own ignorance about things in a sense um, it, for example the class that we were all in we were um, introduced to Al Jazeera which is like a world news network and I had previously been mostly centered with American news networks and seeking out that news network instead, I kind of had a more holistic 
world view of what was going on in the world. And I had to confront my own ignorance about that, that I was just watching American news networks and being fed that perspective. Um, but I think that getting different angles of perceptions is a really big part of unlearning and being able to take in different ideas and being open to that. Openness is a huge part of unlearning as a whole and taking the responsibility to want to do that, I think. What I like about that is it's not just openness as this like steady state, like a we're all like a camera with the lens cap off or something. It's like you got to make room for the new idea which means like owning that you had your worldview was narrow in a way that you didn't want to admit, and so I, I like that a lot. Um, Adam uh, or Linnea, either you want to comment on this round? Questions, Adam? It's just funny because uh, that takes me back to the exact moment I remember. Like we were talking about you know citizenship in this particular class uh, and what that looked like, and we were all giving you know these examples of like patriotism essentially, which was like you know. Um, are you voting from age 18 on and like enacting your constitutional rights? Um, are you being a productive member of your society? And like, what does that actually mean? What does that look like? Um, and that was our, you know, essentially institutionalized definition of a good citizen. And then the next class, we walk into the classroom and she immediately poses, or, or sorry, our teacher poses. Let's give a shout out. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't know if we wanted to call her out yet. Ksenia's over there. She was our wonderful, wonderful, wonderful teacher during this course. Um, can't speak like highly enough about it, but um, she comes in the next day and she says, all right, so I know we've been talking about this whole thing of citizenship. Uh, what's, how does that translate into being a good global citizen? And the room just goes silent. Like nobody knows anything to say. Um, and that's just because, you know, we've had this whole curriculum that has really left out the whole picture. You know, it seems like everything was so narrowed um, and I'm not saying, you know, once again, I'm not saying like radically, oh, it's like the fundamental, we have to relearn education. I'm just saying, you know, there's things that we just simply agree upon, like the common core in New York State, where I'm from, it's like, that is the ultimate form of knowledge that you can gain in your education growing up. Um, and it leaves out so much, like we talked about how much of holistic education was missing, um, like spiritual learning and stuff like that, everything that, you know, could have been there, um, I like thinking about you know everything that could have been. I'm reflective. I think about you know what could have been in my education, yeah. uh, and if given those opportunities to really discuss the whole picture or like alternative perspectives on certain issues, especially when it came to you know even patriotism, I mentioned before you know like being a citizen in America and having discussions about politics and stuff like that. Um, I think a lot of those conversations were really shied away from, um, and I don't know. I just like this concept of unlearning and like defying what has been traditionally agreed upon, which is why I'm so interested in reform. It's just like that's the whole shtick about it. Um, and you underline that there's a, almost a process of mourning. You have to you know, yeah. deal with the fact that you missed very important things. You know, you, you, were, mm -hmm. you were blind before, right? It's yeah. not just a blind spot. It's, yeah. And that's part of, that's part of what I like about um, our major in particular is that a lot of the questions, like you talked about questions before and like what was being asked, um, I think a lot of the questions that sort of started off were questions like, oh, what is this formula? What is this equation? How does this work in this specific setting? And we were almost really hesitant to start asking questions like, oh, how does this all tie together? Or even questions like, you know, what is the bigger picture here? Like, those are the questions we missed out on in, in education just because we were so, you know, like, hard set on, you know, the common core is the right way to do it. I'm not saying I disagree with Common Core. I, li I liked, you know, the way my education was shaped, but I think there's a lot more to it that, yep. you know, needs to be reworked and rethought about. Thank you very much. Okay, last question. Um, to set it up, it seems to me like we sometimes um, struggle with a sort of tension where if formative education becomes thick in the sense that the ideals of the educated person and the good life that inform our teaching are substantive and therefore arguable, then it also becomes more vulnerable to the famous objection, well, whose values, right? And it, and it runs the risk of seeming like um, it's going to be a parochial imposition of one subgroup on others. But if in order to avoid that problem, we start thinning out formative education, then we're into the problem of sort of it becoming just, I don't know, another poster about grit with a cat holding onto a branch in the school library or something, or, you know, a list of the virtues instead of a thick instantiation of how to live a good life. So I guess the, my question is, 
Um, just to give you a minor question here, the central question of like philosophy of ed, you could say for the past hundred years, I'll just throw this out to you, but like, how do you, how do you make sure education is in a pluralistic society? How do we do formative education in a way that isn't narrow and parochial, but isn't sort of just thin little slogans? Who wants to take that? I think that's going to be me. Okay. Um, All right. <laughs> yeah, that's a big question. I think uh, when I think about what you've just said in your question, it comes back to me, what comes back to me is the role of an educator, what it, what fundamentally is an educator supposed to do. And I think for me personally, I think it's less about telling and more about guiding students on their own journey of self-discovery, I guess you could say. And so I think that in this case where there is this plurality, I think that the role of an educator could be, um, as we've touched on a little bit before, leaning into students and where they're coming from and bringing them together in a space that makes conversations available and s telling students that their thoughts and their opinions on these big ideas, what is purpose, maybe what is meaning, that the teachers and educators can lean into that and make sure that they're creating discussion places for that to happen. I think that it would be wrong to exclude more education from school. I think that that would be worse for students if kind of in light of this issue skirted around that and said, let's let's try to minimize the place in the classroom. I think that educators should address it, but I think that there's definitely a lot of, um, yeah, more than telling that student, that educators should create places for students to tell each other and to discuss with each other. And I think the reason I think that is because I believe there's ethical value, maybe one could say, to moral disagreement. I think at least in my classes I've taken with these folks up here, um, there was so much value to when we disagreed in conversations. If we were all sitting there and just agreeing and saying, yeah, I think the same thing, yeah, oh, yep, and all coming to a general conclusion, I think that I wouldn't have gained as many skills and also probably the confidence that I gained in that class of being able to dialogically engage with my classmates and being able to sit with that tension and give reasoning and explanation. So yeah, I think that's a big question, but I think it's it's worth it to have it in the classroom. I love that idea that it's so, so pluralism doesn't mean um, we just don't talk about things and we each keep to ourselves. It, it's an active process that has its own set of values attached with that. I like that answer a lot. Uh, I want to press you a little bit and see which side of one, another question you're on. Do you think that we shouldn't try to keep deep substantive values out of the classroom, or do you think that it's impossible to keep them out? See how there's like two different ways we could take that? I think that if you're aiming for an education of the whole person and that's kind of your stated goal, I think it's going to be impossible because I think you're going to have students come to this place where if they're being treated as whole persons and you're recognizing those different aspects of who they are as individuals, I think that naturally students are going to start bringing those things into the classroom because they're feeling comfortable and recognized and validated and being that whole person who wants to talk about those ideas. Like I said, those are some of my big questions. And so I think that eventually, because of students, I feel like it would turn out to be more impossible. Thank you very much. Follow up, anyone? Emily. To add on to that, um, something that we talked about in our class that we took all together was cosmopolitanism. And one of the definitions that we often return to was how cosmopolitanism is love and care for the whole world. And I mean, I think it's interesting, too, because we read articles by different authors saying that cosmopolitanism um, accepts that everybody can have different opinions. It's not, you know, what you say, it's how you say it. And being able to respectfully disagree with others is a really important skill when you're engaging in respectful dialogue. Um, but then again, to get a little bit meta, how do we all agree that cosmopolitanism is the best way to enter into a, a conversation? Um, and I think when we look at our politics, um, they've become very polar in the last couple of years. And I think that's because a lot of people have lost the ability to respectfully disagree with one another. Um, and yeah, I just think that reading about cosmopolitanism, it's hard not to want to agree with it. And yeah. Thank you very much. I like that you went meta because there's a joke that says, um, if you're a philosopher, the philosopher says, anything you can do, I can do meta. You know that one? <laughs> All right. Well, hey, join me in thanking these folks for sharing their thoughts, would you?
Yeah, we have enough. Okay. Yeah. We'll share if you want to slide that one down. Um, questions? Conversation? Um, I'm Heather Moranges. I'm the um, one of the co-directors of research and assessment at Wake Forest Program for Leadership and Character. We're still introducing ourselves. Um, my question is, so you talked about the institutional blocks to instantiating whole person education, but I'm curious about what you think about the, the personal costs to teach a subject matter thoroughly and also to be there for each and every one of your students' whole person seems really costly. So I'm curious how you guys think about sort of protecting your well-being, um, both personally and, you know, what can institutions do uh, to sort of buttress those support systems? And specifically, you're talking about like teacher support networks and stuff like that? Okay. Um, I, I'll just take this one just because I feel like I answered the question, so I might as well. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a tough task to, you know, sort of reroute the whole sort of report card experience and, you know, take on so much as a teacher and especially like address each and every one of those students individually. Um, and once again, we keep bringing up this class that we took with the wonderful Castenio over there um, in global citizenship. And there was this exercise that we did where we looked at, you know, the difference between a qualitative and a quantitative report card and like what that actually looked like. Um, we talked a lot about, you know, how does a teacher go about addressing all of these qualitative benchmarks, and we really couldn't come up with anything because it's so far outside of, you know, what we're so used to seeing with like, oh, good participation in class and stuff like that. So, you know, there certainly does need to be a significant amount of support given to these teachers um, because it really is a lot, especially when they're, you know, working with five classes a day, uh, 30 student classes each. And you know, there it, it takes. I remember like th the first three weeks was the teacher starting to teach the material, and then also trying to learn everybody's names individually. So it's a tough ask, um, and it's a tough thing to approach. So yes, that is another roadblock. I can 100% see that in like why would we if teacher burnout is already so high, and you know we have so many issues with like turnovers in you know young teachers that are leaving the field to do something else or pursue a second degree or whatever. That you know it's 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 a tough thing to approach and lend support to, especially since, you know, the teacher community is already, you know, th there's the saying that goes like, you know, those who can do and those who can't teach. And so it's, you know, it, it's a tough, a tough field to sort of, you know, step your foot into and just go with the flow. Yeah. I just want to say something quick too. Uh, at least from my perspective, I'm realizing that I'm thinking a lot about students as whole people. And I think we could all agree that in a holistic, formative, educational approach in any um, educational setting, it's the teachers who are also whole people as well. And so I think that as teachers, we a lot of times want to focus on our students and administers, administrators as well. But I think that I would also say there needs to be a change in the way that perhaps administrators are thinking about their um, teachers and educators just as much as educators are thinking about their students. Yeah. Sorry, I had a burning thought on that as well. <laughs> um, I think one of the th main things that like combats teacher turnover is like support within the school. Um, and also teachers need to be paid more. And so many teachers are being buying their own school supplies for their students with their own money. And this is where the burnout is. They can't take a real vacation because they, that's not within the scope of what they're given. So I think that um, if a greater value in society was placed on teachers and they were given more money, then they would be able to feel more valued and just have more support and be able to do more valuable things with their time and take care of themselves better. So I think that that's a really important aspect as well. I also think that a small start and through my teacher ed courses with BC and like being able to be in classrooms with teachers, I think it really starts within the classroom and school communities and establishing you know, with going back to the whole person aspect, if you have all these individual students and then the teacher themselves are an individual and that network is created, that's a great way to establish respect. And if it does happen that the teacher becomes overwhelmed by that, by what's going on in the classroom, either management or trying to achieve all the curriculum things, 
Um, relying on like fellow teachers, I think, is something that I've seen and that have I've been taught to feel comfortable to reach out to your coworkers or reach out to your administration and that kind of thing. And of course, it's easier said than done to try to make these things happen, but I think that's a baby step to establishing more security and that kind of thing. Thank you. Other uh, Tony Clemmer, Wisdom for Good. First of all, thank you. These deep insights from uh, all of you students are, are amazing. Um, we've heard about globalization and uh, diversity. When I think of a uh, whole person or whole child, I, I sort of think of a model of cognitive, affective, and moral. And I, except for the last question that Chris had, I haven't heard a lot about the moral piece of it. Can, in any way, shape, or form, can you address how that enters into this uh, work for you all? Sorry, okay, we're back on. Um, it's it's difficult to sort of take on the task of approaching a moral ground because I think as you know, we, Chris mentioned it briefly before, where if you have a set of values that you're sort of you know teaching, then it's to the point of like whose values, um, and I guess like acknowledging that there's you know a widely agreed upon you know like moral code of behavior and whatnot. I think that's, you know, it's something that can be approached, but I think needs to be treated very carefully when you're like talking about, because I almost want to consider sort of a moral code or like teaching morality as also teaching behavior, which I think is difficult to approach. Um, and before I sort of derail my train of thought too much, I'm gonna hand it off to Linnea. <laughs> okay. I guess uh, my first thought was I'm a psychology major, or I was a psychology major, and a lot of what um, I was studying was developmental psychology and particularly morality with children. So that's a great question that I'd love to answer. And there's a bunch of experiments about how children, one of my favorite ones is you show little children two puppets. This is before they're verbal. And one of the puppets is harming another animal animal puppet and the other is not. And then you present the puppets to the child at a later point. And in this particular study, the child chooses the one that didn't do the harm to the other puppet. And so I think I'm saying that just to say that I think children from even before they're verbal are very attuned to these moral issues and are able to develop these sort of understandings themselves. And so I think that when it comes to what's educator's role, I think that starting at that point with realizing that children have these natural tendencies and how can we lean into those. And I think in the classroom, when it comes to morality and being pluralistic, I would have to say as well um, that teachers should acknowledge and yeah, acknowledge and kind of embrace that they're not the only educators in children's lives. I think that a lot of times we think of teachers as having that place and it's awesome that they do, but acknowledging that children have educators in their lives, whether community members, family members. Yeah, yeah, and so I would say that, yeah, when it comes to holistic education, that part being ignored, I think it's kind of scary for a lot of educators, but I would once again say that it would be better to give options and to lean on students to share those options with each other if perhaps educators feel that they don't want to step overstep many boundaries in providing just a this is the one way. But uh, that was also a ramble on my part. So sorry. <laughs> Anybody else? Is, did that help or do you have any follow up questions for us? OK. <laughs> hey, my name is uh, Maxwell Smith. I run an online school. Um, I'm very curious uh, for you as learners, how has your participation in TES changed your present and your future selves? <laughs> oh, I'm not a TES major and I entered a TE TES class not knowing that that's what it was about, and I ended up really enjoying this class. This class was what made me think the most um, in terms of change for myself. Um, 
it made me look at education differently, which is I had completed two years, two and a half years of college at that point as an elementary education major, and it completely shifted my perspective of how to approach teaching, how to be in education as a field, and I think that engaging with the TES studies, like really back to the openness concept, like being able to grapple different perspectives and that sort of thing, um, that's most of where my change happened, just having a more open approach to what education means and what it is and how it can look and all that kind of stuff. Can you reassure folks that we did not pay her to say that? <laughs> I was not paid to say that. <laughs> I think also, um, I feel like these classes really push me as a student to grow, and I think that that's not, I don't really see that among my other friends, I think, um, that are in, like, different majors. It depends on the major, but I think sometimes when you have your head in a textbook, you're so focused on getting the right answer that you forget to grow yourself as a person. Um, and so I feel like within the major, every time I come to class, there's a very challenging question that makes me rethink a lot of what I've learned in the past. For example, we were talking about like the hidden curriculum of schooling and our K through 12 educations. And um, like, for example, one thing that I had never thought about was about how when the bell would ring in school and if you weren't at class on time, then you would go to detention. And where did those concepts come from? And how did that make us feel as students? Did that make us feel accepted in our environments? Or did it kind of make us feel like truants from a really young age? And so <laughs> uh, I think just to build off of your question, I think that um, our classes are always really like pushing our mind to reconsider the world around us. I backed out of this question. Hi, I'm uh, Michael West from the University of Dallas. And um, you haven't been, but those of us on this side have been looking at that screen. And the, the title is Transformative Education, Formative Justice. And there's a lot of really big words in there. And um, I wonder if we can think about justice for a minute. Um, do you think that transformative education is a matter of justice? Do you think that it complements the achievement of justice? How do you see the relationship between those really big, complicated words that we're all grappling with in this room? That everybody deserves the type of education that I feel like I've received at this school. And I think that that is a matter of justice. And I think that in the fields of educational equity, what we're looking at is where schools are falling short for students. So I think that if we're learning these concepts, I, I feel very driven to go after a career that's gonna make education a better place for students and to seek justice and to give students within like public schools those experiences as well. I think it's something that everybody should have access to and nobody, a lot of people don't have access to that. So I do think it's a matter of justice and how we can provide that service um, in our careers. Sorry, a lot of turning on and off the mics, but um, for me, one of the big things when I was considering teaching, um, and I was a secondary ed major for the first two years of my college career up until this major came about. Um, and for me, it was hard for me to reconcile, you know, going to be a teacher and knowing everything I know about, you know, like the resource gaps that are available, the differences between, you know, I, I went to school at a blue ribbon school on Long Island, um, and I had a few friends that went to Brentwood, which is a school district that has very minimal funding. Um, I know of some of the teachers there that literally had to buy the textbooks that they wanted for their students. Um, and so, you know, having all of this sort of sensory input uh, and also wanting to be a teacher and going into the high school that, you know, going back to the high school that I went to, it was an issue for me to say, you know, oh, my education is preparing me for a job and that's good enough. Um, I think that the transformative ed department that we've sort of had here uh, enacts justice in the way that it it, it really is eye opening. Um, we talk about unlearning, you know, traditions around education a lot, um, and I think you know being pushed to ask these sort of questions 
like, you know, where is holistic ed like in the classroom? How can we implement it? Even if it's just like as me going into teaching, how can I implement holistic ed on a small scale and still kind of fit it into common core? Um, but, you know, there's a lot of a lot of questions in my head about, you know, teaching as a field and what I expect of myself as a teacher. Um, and I think that this, this sort of major has really sort of honed in on, you know, the important questions that I need to ask myself. And uh, we we were thinking about hope a lot earlier. So I want to follow up that last question with that little word, hope. What's the relationship between your thinking about transformative education and hope? There we go. Um, I think an immediate connection for me between transformative education and hope is that it gives youth students um, hope about our future. I think definitely for me, as I've taken this class that we all participated in, I think that it's given me hope that people like me and other people who are younger than me as they come up through the school system, that they are going to be equipped to be able to enter these places of contention, of these places of big questions of what are we gonna do as a society? And I think for me, it's given me a lot of hope about the ability of myself and my peers to, to tackle those things instead of saying, this is too hard. I guess it's something for the adults. Now I'm thinking, you know, this is something I can do. I'm, I guess I'm technically an adult now by age, but um, I think for me, the definite connection there is that it has given me a sense of hope about myself and my ability to go out into the world and, um, Make it the place that I want to see it be. Yeah. Going off of that, um, for me personally, like the reason I wanted to get into education is because I had teachers that made me appreciate education and love school. And school is my entire life, always has been, always will be since I want to become a teacher. Um, but I'm like engaging in these courses and understanding what transformative education is, it makes me very hopeful that education will continue to be something that inspires or is going to create these individuals that will enter society and be able to be thoughtful and insightful and be the individuals that will change the world hopefully one day. So that's kind of the hope approach that I have with transformative education. Um, just one thing that came into mind was I also, you know, wanted to be a teacher since I was a young age. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen Shawshank Redemption, but in the same way Red was institutionalized in the prison. I, I'm not saying school's a prison, but I, I love where I am and I'm excited to go back. And, you know, sorry for the derailment there, but uh, we talk about student agency a lot and, you know, what we can do as educators to sort of instill, you know, or create these goal-driven individuals and I think that that's part of the whole conversation around hope is giving people the opportunity to see what they can become um, and I think you know we talk a lot about purpose meaning and potential um, as like you know three things that we want to see more of in or being taught more of in the classroom um, and address more in the classroom um, and just all of those things that we you know cover in a wide range of classes, whether it's, you know, our reimagining school and society class, where we're actually talking about fundamentally, like, what are the issues here and what can we see being changed? You know, it's all it's all coming back to that idea of is there, you know, hope for us in the future? And we've talked a little bit about, you know, being cynical around certain aspects of education and whatnot. But there really is um, a lot that, you know, this program does to push people like us to make it a better environment. Um, and so I think that's sort of where the hope stems from. One last question. Oh, perfect. Last word or last question. Don't hastily say perfect, but uh, <laughs> um, 
so thank you, all of you, for this. This has been very enlightening and very heartening to hear from you guys and to see the wonderful things that are going on here. Apparently, 28 days in, I, I feel like you uh, <laughs> feel like you've had a head start on it. Um, a quick question, maybe, um, is I'm you know you were just talking about agency, and I was wondering if if you all would be interested in talking more about your thoughts on liberty, and you know, thinking about the question on justice, it seems clear from what you're saying, of course, one can see inequity as an issue of injustice and oppression. Um, but one might also think about uh, injustice and as, uh, oppression as things that are also harming a student and their liberty. So I was kind of curious how you understand student liberty, the degrees to which it should be respected. Um, is uh, transformative education preparing students for the exercise of their liberty? Um, and also, just really briefly, also thinking about, you know, uh, Michael earlier was also talking about issues of the will, right? And I think on some level, there's an issue of free will there. So I'm just curious to know your thoughts on on that dimension of education. Thank you. What first came to mind when you asked about liberty was I think that like we've been talking about the common core and I feel like college was the first time that I got to choose what I was learning and really feel like interested in what I was learning. And I think that, yes, there are certain concepts that need to be taught to students so that they are prepared for the next level of learning, but where can we create pockets of liberty within schools? Um, something we learned in the transformative educational class with Scott Sider was about how some of the greatest learning came in extracurricular activities when they were measuring learning in schools, um, whether that was like after school theater, after school soccer. Um, and I think that that's a way for students to exercise their agency. I do think we need to have more opportunities for that um, for at a younger age for students so that they can practice exercising their liberty and their will. Wonderful. Chris, do you want to say anything to wrap it up? Or are we good? Oh. It was just a small comment. I was just going to say, I think it really comes back to letting students explore what they're interested in. I think a lot of students come into the class. Well, I think depending on the education they come in with, students come in being told this is what you should be interested in. This is what, you know, you should pursue versus I picture more holistic education, having students enter the classroom and say, what are you interested in? What do you want to pursue? and how can I help you get there and provide resources and my own insight and you know, um, prompt the insights of your classmates into whatever you're interested in. And so I think that that's what came to mind for me when you said liberty is that uh, students have their interests that they're maybe already leaning towards or that if they don't already, I really think that education should make it a place where students aren't coming and sitting down and saying, tell me what to do, tell me what to pursue, what to be interested in, but that um, you know, a holistic education will, a couple years down the road as it becomes more adopted, have it be where students already feel like they have that sense of liberty to do that themselves and come to school and do that. We're done at 2.30. College, 1933 to 1957. Um, gone but not forgotten, and uh, first rector John Andrew Rice um, would hold office hours with his new uh, arrivees, the uh, first year students, on the porch of Eureka Hall, uh, sitting there in the in the rocking chairs, looking at the mountains. And one of the students tells a story that um, he was nervous when I talked to this guy, he's the head of the college, and and uh, Rice asked him, "So, what are you interested in?" And the student reflects, "It was the first time anyone had ever asked me that." Um, yeah, sorry, just real quick. I'm so surprised that it actually came back to this, but we have these three main questions here at BC that sort of guide, you know, your decision making in finding yourself, finding your major and stuff like that. And the three questions are, what are you good at? What does the world need you to be? And oh, wait, I think I said them out of order. Sorry. What do you enjoy? What are you good at? And what does the world need you to be? Um, and those three questions, I think, sort of could serve as like guiding principles in terms of you know talking about student agency and developing our full selves, I think I was just just felt like we should bring that in. I don't know. Thank you, yeah. <laughs>